Number one. All right, so we have a rotor rod. We know the radius is eight feet and the period is two seconds. Determine the minimum coefficient of static friction. Okay, so that's to keep the riders stuck to the wall. So we're looking for the coefficient of static friction. Okay, I'm going to draw a free body diagram. Okay, so here's a rider on the wall, stuck to the wall, you might say. There has to be a force of static friction upward, which is equal to the rider's weight, which is downward. And since it's a minimum coefficient of static friction, um, that means this person's on the verge of slipping. So this is the maximum force of static friction, right, because it's just on the verge of breaking away and then kinetic friction would take over as the person slides down the wall. Now I'm going to draw another free body diagram which um, is showing a side view of the person. And that's so that I can introduce the normal force which provides the necessary centripetal force. Okay, and you have the weight down and the force of static friction maximum. And then I'm going to show the radius, r. So I'm going to start with an equation that will introduce the coefficient of static friction. So that would be maximum force of static friction is equal to coefficient of static friction times the normal force. Solving for mu s, I get the maximum force of static friction for the normal force. Now the maximum force of static friction has to be equal to the weight, and that's from Newton's second law. Sum of the forces is equal to ma, but here we have a vertical acceleration of zero, so the net force on the person got to be zero. Therefore, the maximum force of static friction is equal to the person's weight, where the weight is found from Newton's second law to be equal to mg. Now we said earlier that the normal force is equal to um, the centripetal force, so that's we can set that equal to the mass of the person times the speed of the rotor ride um, where the person is standing squared over the radius. So we have Fn is equal to mv squared over r. The mass is canceled, so it doesn't matter what the mass of the person is, and we're left with g r all over v squared. Now the speed can be found using distance over time. So we have the circumference of the circle, 2 pi r, divided by the time to go around once, the period. So we have rg over 2 pi r over the period squared, so we get 4 pi squared r squared over the period squared. And I can rewrite this as r g period squared over 4 pi squared r squared. r goes into r squared once. So we get g period squared over 4 pi squared r as our answer. And then we can substitute in the values and get the coefficient of static friction. So we have 10 meters per second squared multiplied by 2 seconds squared, divided by 4 pi squared times the radius, which is 8 feet. Now, mistake. Okay, G, we should use 32 feet per second squared since we're in the British engineering system. So we change this 32 feet per second squared. Okay, so let's see what we get. I'm getting 0.4, so the coefficient of static friction is 0.4. Number two, we have a merry-go-round, and they want to know how um, 
the center directed acceleration varies with the distance to the center of the miracle round. So how does the center directed acceleration vary with the distance to the center of the miracle round? Well, the centripetal acceleration is equal to the speed squared over r. So this would be the speed of one of the horses on the miracle round, a distance r from the center of the miracle round. But speed is distance over time, so I can rewrite this as 4 pi squared r over the period squared. This tells us that the centripetal acceleration varies directly with the radius. Remember, the period is a constant because that's the time for any of the horses to go around once, which would have to be the same for every horse. OK, number three. OK, we have um, a space station. And inside the space station, there is a rotating room to simulate gravity for the astronauts. And an astronaut climbs down the ladder, and they want to know how his apparent weight varies with the distance from the center of the hub. OK, so this is in deep space. So we can assume that the, the gravity is negligible, zero. Um, or we can just assume that this is in free fall orbiting around the Earth. Same, same thing. Now, as he climbs down the ladder, the only force acting on him would be the normal force, which is exerted on him by the rungs of the ladder toward his head, okay, toward his body. And that's his apparent weight. So we can write Fn is equal to mv squared over r, where r is where he's located on the ladder. So let's say he's right here. So the normal force, which acts toward the center of the rotating room, is the centripetal force as well. I mean, that provides the centripetal force. So we can set that equal to mv squared over r, where his speed at any moment is equal to 4 pi squared, his speed squared at any moment, at any moment would be 4 pi squared r squared over the period squared, all right? So his speed is 2 pi r over the period. If you square that, you get 4 pi squared r squared over the period squared. r goes into r squared once, so we end up with m 4 pi squared r over the period squared. So his apparent weight varies directly with the distance he is away from the center of the rotating room. Now, there is a part B. They say, well, let's say the length of the ladder is 15 feet. What should the period of the centrifuge be in order to create moonlight gravity on the centrifuge's floor? Well, moonlight gravity, moonlight gravity, moonlight gravity, is one sixth that of Earth's gravity. So we're going to divide Fn by six, set that equal to the person's mass, times four pi squared. R is what we're looking for over the period squared. So solving for R, we get Fn over six, m four pi squared times the period squared. Now, Fn is his apparent weight, so let's set that equal to mg. Okay, and we're still dividing it by 6. The m's cancel. So r is equal to g period squared over 6, 4, pi squared. So we're going to take 10. Let's see. It's, um, yeah, I guess we can use the, let's use the English system, British engineering system again. 
So 32 feet per second squared. And then the period, oh, that's what we're looking for, the period. I'm sorry. So we're going to, we know R. We know R. So we're solving for the period. So the period squared, let's see, is equal to R times 6M, 4 pi squared, all over Fn. Where Fn, we can express as Mg. So the period is equal to the square root of that. The m's cancel. Okay, so r is 15 feet. We're uh, multiplying that by 6 times 4 pi squared all over 32 feet per second squared. So that's our period. And I'm getting 10.5 seconds. Okay, that would create simulated gravity so that the astronauts feel like they're on the moon. Number four, we have um, imagine an aquarium containing water being um, linearly accelerated. And they want to know the, um, what it looks like in this vessel when it's accelerating. Okay, well, we know that the liquid in a liquid accelerometer, okay, let me see if I can get one here. Okay, it looks like this when you accelerate. Okay, so that's to the right, and that's to the left. If it's spinning, since the slope of the liquid in the liquid accelerometer is directly proportional to the acceleration, when it spins, we're going to get a parabolic curve. And the reason is, is because we saw earlier that the centripetal acceleration is also directly proportional to the radius of the circle. So since the liquid slope is directly proportional to the acceleration, and since the acceleration is directly proportional to the radius of the circle, then the slope of the liquid has to constantly change. So at the middle, for example, it has to have zero slope, the liquid, and that slope has to increase in direct proportion to the radius. So if we take a look at this spinning, okay, and let me show you that right now. Right, you get a parabolic curve. So that shows that the acceleration varies directly with the radius. Number five, it says determine the apparent weight of a 400 Newton person in the dip of a coaster. The radius of the coaster's dip is 35 meters and its speed is 30 meters per second. So let's draw a free body diagram of the person in the dip of the coaster. So we have his normal force, that's his apparent weight, and then we have the rider's weight. The normal force has to be greater than the rider's weight in order for him to pull out of that dip, right? You need a net force to divert him from a straight line path. Okay, we're given the radius and we know the speed. Okay, so the radius is um, 35 meters. The rider's speed is given. Okay, that's equal to 30 meters per second. And the rider's apparent weight is 400 newtons. I'm sorry, uh, his actual weight is 400 newtons. 
want us to figure out is apparent weight, which is Fn. So from Newton's second law, the net force is Fn minus the weight, calling up positive. And his acceleration is V squared over R, so centripetal acceleration. So solving for Fn, we get the person's weight plus mv squared over r, where m is from Newton's second law, weight over g. Okay, so there's the equation. And I'm going to simplify this. We have weight times the quantity 1 plus v squared over rg. Okay, so now we can substitute in the values. We have his weight, 400 newtons times 1 plus his speed, 30 meters per second, squared all over the radius, 35 meters, times g, 10 meters per second squared, we're in the international system. So let's see what we get for his apparent weight. And I'm getting 1,428 newtons. Okay, so we're talking about about 3.6 g's. So he feels about 3.6 times his actual weight at the bottom of this dip on the coaster. The next one, number six, it says the swing ride is a popular amusement park ride. Show that the swing angle is independent of a rider's mass. Okay, so I'm going to draw a free body diagram of the person sitting on the swing. So we have the weight of the person down. We have the tension in, this, in the um, string supporting him. And that's it. Break the tension up into its x and y parts. And you can see that the y part of the tension must be equal to the weight. That's from Newton's second law. And then the tension in the x is, provides the necessary centripetal force. So I'm going to start with Tx is equal to the mass of the rider times speed squared over r. Okay, let me show you the radius. There it is. And as far as the angle, we're looking at the swing angle. I'm going to call this the swing angle. So Tx is equal to T sine theta, and that's equal to mv squared over r. Now, we said earlier, or I said earlier, that Ty is equal to weight. That's from the second law, where Ty is T cosine of the angle and weight is mg. I'm going to solve this for t. And I'll substitute this into this expression. And I get mg tangent of theta is equal to mv squared over r. And you notice that the mass cancels. And that does show that the swing angle is independent of the mass. Number seven. The movie 2001 A Space Odyssey features a rotating wheel space station named Space Station 5. Its radius 150 meters. Its uh, rotational period is 61 seconds. And they want to know if those conditions um, create um, a normal force that's equal to that of moon's gravity. So we want to see if the normal force is equal to 1 6 the weight on Earth. So I'm going to write Fn is equal to mv squared over r. That's from the second law. The normal force, center directed force, is equal to mv squared over r, where the mass is weight over g. And the speed is 2 pi r over the period. So we're squaring that. So we get 4 pi squared r squared over the period squared. But r goes into r squared once. So we end up with r in the numerator. So what we're going to do is figure out what 4 pi squared r is divided by the period, which is 61 seconds squared, 
and see if that's equal to one six the weight of the person. If it is, that means that it does simulate moon gravity. Okay, and I'm getting about 0.16. Okay, this should be 10 meters per second squared, so I'm getting about 0.16 W. So 0.2 W, so that's 2 tenths, or 1 fifth, the weight. Now part B wants us to check the orbital altitude of the station. Okay, in the movie they claim it to be 210 miles. So let's see what it is um, according, let's see if that's correct according to the other information they give us. So we have the, um, they tell us that the um, orbital period here is 91 minutes. Okay, so let's see if you have an orbital period of 91 minutes, what the altitude would have to be above the Earth so that it stays in orbit. Okay, okay so I'm going to first convert the period over to seconds so that we're in the international system. So I'm getting 5,460 seconds. Okay, so here's the space station. Let's find H. Okay, the radius of the Earth is 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. All right, so the centripetal force is provided by the weight, which is the gravitational force on the space station. So I can write um, mg at this location is equal to the mass of the space station times the mass of the Earth times universal gravitation constant all over Re plus H. The acceleration due to gravity at the space station's location would be equal to the speed of the space station squared all over the orbital radius, which is Re plus H. Okay, by the way, this quantity is squared. Now B, the speed, is equal to 2 pi times the orbital radius. So that's 2 pi times Re plus H all over the period. But we're squaring that. So we get M times 4 pi squared Re plus H squared. But there's Re plus H in the denominator. So that goes into the numerator once all over the period squared. And that's equal to G M M E all over Re plus H squared. So we need to solve here for altitude. So I'm going to take this term times that term, and we'll get Re plus H cubed times the mass times 4 pi squared all over the period squared equals to the universal gravitation constant times the mass of the space station times the mass of the Earth. But if I want isolating Re plus H cubed, canceling out the mass of the space station because it appears on both sides, I get this expression. Taking the cube root of both sides, I get this expression solving for H. That 
expression. Okay, so let's do the numbers. We have the cube root. G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. The mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Okay, the period we're told. Now part B wants us to check the orbital altitude of the station. Okay, in the movie they claim it to be 210 miles. So let's see what it is um, according, let's see if that's correct according to the other information they give us. So we have the, um, they tell us that the um, orbital period here is 91 minutes. Okay, so let's see if you have an orbital period of 91 minutes, what the altitude would have to be above the Earth so that it stays in orbit. I'm going to first convert the period over to seconds so that we're in the international system. So I'm getting 5,460 seconds. Okay, so here's the space station. Let's find H. Okay, the radius of the Earth. 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. All right, so the centripetal force is provided by the weight, which is the gravitational force on the space station. So I can write um, mg at this location is equal to the mass of the space station times the mass of the Earth times universal gravitation constant all over Re plus H. The acceleration due to gravity at the space station's location would be equal to the speed of the space station squared all over the orbital radius, which is Re plus H. Okay, by the way, this quantity is squared. Now B, the speed is equal to 2 pi times the orbital radius. So that's 2 pi times R e plus h all over the period. But we're squaring that. So we get m times 4 pi squared R e plus h squared. But there's R e plus h in the denominator. So that goes into the numerator once all over the period squared. And that's equal to G M M E all over R E plus H squared. So we need to solve here for altitude. So I'm going to take this term times that term, and we'll get R E plus H cubed times the mass times 4 pi squared all over the period squared equals to the universal gravitation constant times the mass of the space station times the mass of the Earth. But if I want isolating Re plus H cubed, canceling out the mass of the space station because it appears on both sides, I get this expression. Taking the cube root of both sides, This expression solving for H. I get that expression. Okay, so let's do the numbers. We have the cube root. G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. The mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Okay, the period we're told is. 5,460 seconds, we're squaring that, we're dividing that by 4 pi squared, and then we have to subtract out the radius of the Earth. Please stand. So there's the radius of the Earth. I'll do the calculation, and we'll compare that to the movie's altitude, 
which is 210 miles. Okay, so all I'm getting. Three hundred and ten, three hundred and eleven thousand meters. Three hundred and eleven thousand meters. Okay, so now I'm going to convert that over to miles just to see how it compares to what they say it is in the movie. And I'm getting 193, 193 miles. So that's pretty close. That's pretty, pretty accurate. Okay, so this is the same thing as 193 miles.